Welcome to our final video on Green's functions. In our first two installments of section 4.8, we took a look at what a Green's function is and how we could use them to help solve non-homogeneous differential equations with homogeneous initial conditions. Uh, here we're going to take a look at taking it one step further and using Green's functions and uh, the solution that comes from them as a stepping stone to help solve uh, a non-homogeneous differential equation with non-homogeneous initial conditions. So we're going to take a look here together at exercise number 28, which appears in section 4.8. Uh, they want us to solve uh, the initial value problem that you see there. We can see that it's a non-homogeneous Cauchy-Euler type differential equation of second order. And notice that it has non-homogeneous initial conditions. Notice in particular that the value of the function at the point of interest one is not zero. It's equal to one. So we have non-homogeneous initial conditions here. Uh, nevertheless, we're going to begin, we're going to proceed as we have before uh, by using uh, the Green's function for this differential equation to help come up first with a solution to the differential equation uh, as if it had homogeneous initial conditions. Uh, the nice thing here is that this particular differential equation, we've already taken a look and found what its Green's function was. Way back in our first video, uh, we found that the Green's function for this particular problem was x squared over t minus x. And we found that by using the, the two solutions to the homogeneous equation, x and x squared, uh, we used the formula for Green's functions to find that expression. Now, remember that when we're coming up with a particular solution using Green's function, we're always integrating from x sub zero up to x. Here, x sub zero is equal to one. So we're integrating from one up to x. Also notice that, uh, remember, we're always multiplying the, uh, in the integrand the Green's function by the what we call the forcing function, the f of t. It's very important to note here that the forcing function here is not t log t. Uh, the expression that initially appears on the right-hand side is x log x. But notice that in this form, there is a coefficient of y double prime that isn't one. Um, we always need to take a look at the standard form of the differential equation where the coefficient of y double prime is one for purposes of reading off the forcing function. So here, the forcing function isn't x log x, it's x log x divided by x squared, which is actually log x divided by x. And so that's why in the integrand here, we're multiplying the Green's function by log t over t, because in the standard form for the second order differential equation, the forcing function is log x over x. And so what we need to do is we need to find this antiderivative, the antiderivative of the product of x squared over t minus x times log t over t. So let's take a look at that integral then. Here on our new screen, we see the integral worked out. Uh, we've got two parts to the integral. Uh, the first part has an x squared that can be factored out. Remember, x is not the variable of integration. And the second part has an x that can be factored out. So we have to do the antiderivatives of the log of t over t squared and the log of t over t. Uh, the second one of those two is a little bit easier to do. It can be done just by a substitution of letting u equal to log t. And we find out that the antiderivative of the log of t over t is one half of the square of the natural logarithm of t. The first integration, the integration of log t over t squared, that's going to involve an integration by parts. Uh, but we can do it by parts. And when we uh, find the antiderivative, 
we find out it turns out to be the negative of the log t over t minus one over t. So we have our antiderivatives by parts and by substitution. We evaluate at the upper and lower limits of x and one and do the subtraction. And when all is said and done, we find out that the particular solution here is the negative of x log x minus x plus x squared minus one half times x times log squared of x. And this is going to be our particular solution. Now remember, what we know about this is that this solves the original differential equation, but has homogeneous initial conditions. In other words, it makes the equation true, which is what we want, but it doesn't satisfy the initial conditions that we want. So we need to, to go on to a second step here, a final step to finish the problem. And in our final step, what we're going to do, nope, oh, wrong screen. In our final step, see if we can bring up our right correct screen here. Perhaps. There we have it. In our final step, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look back at the solution to the homogeneous differential equation. Remember, we had found initially that the homogeneous differential equation had solutions of x and x squared. So that means that c1 times x plus c2 times x squared is a solution to the homogeneous differential equation. Now think about that. If I were to create a solution that was the sum of the solution that I've already found and this solution to the homogeneous equation, it'll of course still solve the non-homogeneous differential equation because uh, by the rules of differentiation, the derivative of the sum of two functions is the sum of the derivatives. And so what are we gonna get? We're gonna get the function on the right-hand side plus zero uh, if we add together a solution to the homogeneous equation to the particular solution that we already have. So in other words, what we're going to do is we're gonna find a solution to the homogeneous differential equation that obeys the initial conditions that we're looking for. And by superimposing this on the solution that we have from Green's function, it will not only continue to solve the non-homogeneous differential equation, but now it will also solve the, uh, the non-homogeneous or satisfy the non-homogeneous initial conditions as well. The neat thing here is that in finding the constant C1 and C2, and you can see the work for it here, uh, we only need to use the solution to the homogeneous equation for purposes of finding C1 and C2. Um, so when we invoke the condition that y of 1 equals 1, we get that C1 plus C2 equals 1. When we invoke the condition that the derivative at 1 equals 0, we get that C1 plus 2C2 equals 0. Put together those two constraints are going to tell us that c2 has to equal negative 1, and so therefore that c1 equals 2. So now we have a nice solution to the homogeneous problem 2x minus x squared. But this is not just any solution to the homogeneous differential equation. It's the solution to the homogeneous equation which also satisfies our non-homogeneous initial conditions. So when I superimpose that together with the solution y sub p that came from my Green's function, these two now are going to have the property that number one, they solve the non-homogeneous differential equation. Uh, because the Green's function solution did that. And it also satisfied the non-homogeneous initial conditions because my complementary function, y sub c, does that. So by superimposing them, I'll have both of the properties that I'm looking for. 
When I do that together, we add them together, we're going to find out a couple of the terms, minus x squared and x squared add together to zero, and we get a little bit of uh, simplification. Our final solution ends up being minus x log x minus one half x log squared of x plus x when I put together the complementary function and the solution, the particular solution from Green's function. So there you have it. There's a solution to a non-homogeneous initial condition problem of a non-homogeneous differential equation. We do everything that we would have done to solve a problem with homogeneous initial conditions through Green's functions. And then we superimpose this solution uh, from the homogeneous equation that satisfies the initial conditions that we're looking for. I hope this has been instructive and I wish you well.